So uh, just, I am videotaping this, and it will be on YouTube if you're with a significant other that you shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> right now. Um, thank you all for coming. This is great thank to you. see everybody back here. No COVID, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, we just wanted to take a few minutes to let Chris, who is actually incapable of a few minutes, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he's going to tell you all about the new speakers. And, sorry? I said, look who's talking. Yeah, look who's talking. I know. You can't shut me up. Um, and uh, with that, I will just uh, let Chris just take over. But again, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, I didn't get a chance to be here uh, in 2019. That was right before I started with the company, but uh, the loudspeaker efforts were actually well on the way already at that time. So this has been a project that's been going on for many years. And, and Paul, you know, one of the things he's best known for is being very public about our development process and sort of how products are made, what the potential schedules are, some of the things we're working on. So this was a project that took many years and kind of had a couple of false starts. You know, we wanted to make sure, I mean, because the, the challenge was uh, nothing short of, hey, we want to have something that's going to have the dynamics and engagement of live music and, you know, be easy to place in a room and deep, powerful bass and just, you know, easy stuff like that. So uh, we, we had this very high bar and also something that was kind of iconic and unique looking that didn't look like other products exactly and had, had our own flavor to it. So um, we started. Uh, you know, kind of working from a clean sheet of paper. This was a ground up effort for even this version uh, of the speaker. There had been, you know, numerous efforts going on there. And um, the, the core technology we wanted to base it around was uh, planar magnetic drivers. So my, my personal history is my, my dad had a speaker company uh, in the 80s and early 90s. And uh, one of the engineers from there became a expert on planar magnetic drivers. And actually when Paul had Genesis loudspeakers in the 90s, they were buying drive units from that company. And so I sort of have a, uh, an association through the work of my father and his company with, um, with Paul. But th that technology um, gives uh, sort of a, uh, a really clean, um, clear, open mid-range sound. This is, I've got some little visual aids I can hand around. This is a, our plane magnetic mid-range. So I worked at a company in my early 20s called Bullender Grabner that was that engineer from my dad's company's company. So I sort of was there after he left doing engineering work. And um, it, those of you that are familiar with the sound of like electrostats or planers, you know, good ones can have this very sort of airy, effortless, you know, open mid-range sound. Um, but the, the challenge in the past was dynamics. Do they play loud and have impact? And then also how do you mate low frequencies to them because they didn't, have extended bass or the bass didn't match up well with the sound of the planers. So this was our big task. So we made a, uh, took and sort of resurrected some of the work that BG had done. They're no longer in business, um, but increased the performance. So this is a 95 dB sensitive diaphragm. It's made of an ultra thin plastic. It's 12 microns thick, you know, and it's actually lighter than the air load that it's driving. So the, the benefit of all of that is um, you get the dynamics, you get the power handling, but it has, there's no translational components in a planer. You don't have, you know, in, in a traditional woofer, you have all these things getting in the way of the signal being reproduced. You have a coil of wire that connects to a tube, that connects to suspension, that connects to a cone, that connects to a surround. And all those things are potential sources of, re of resonances in a planer. It's just a coil of wire with only a few turns directly driving the diaphragm. And so, you, you know, super clean, you know, resonance-free mid-range. And um, so that was sort of the foundational component of the speaker. So we developed that. And um, the challenge next was how do you, you know, match up a woofer to that? Because we wanted to have, um, you know, a seamless transition there. So uh, we, instead of going to the market, we developed our own transducers. So th on these tables here are some of the transducer projects we've had. So that's my personal background is developing high performance woofers. And the benefit there is you have this speed and effortlessness in a planer. How do you keep up with that with a woofer? A woofer actually is the weak part of the system. It has 20% distortion at its rated X max. So how, how, when it moves, 
uh, you know, that's how much distortion it's making. And you're used to seeing, you know, fractions of a percent of distortion when you talk about amplifiers and other system components. So this was the big challenge. So we took, uh, to make a fast sounding woofer, you want wide bandwidth, you want it to be able to play high cleanly, but you also want to be able to have high power handling excursion um, to, to do deep bass. So this is an example of what we came up with. So there's another kind of heavy visual aid. So what it is, is a, um, and here's, a, here's one of the cones that you can pass around if you want. Um, yeah, so what we ended up doing was um, working on, the. it's actually in the magnet structure. We have a unique magnet structure that doesn't compress. So normally what happens in a, uh, a normal magnet is when the, the cone moves in and out, it has less and less motor force. And that's just a positional compression that compresses the music as sound is going through it. When a bass note goes in, it actually modulates the whole mid-range up and down. Um, and so this is one of the big sources of distortion in speakers. Um, we also did a, made our own suspension, so the suspension was linear moving in versus out. That's a big problem with a lot of woofers, is, is that kind of distortion. So we made this ultra high performance woofer to match up with the planers. And that is the foundational technology. And now we're making a product line based off of those ideas. So we have we started with this large model here. This is called our Aspen FR30. So that has four of our high performance eight inch woofers and then these planer drivers we talked about. Uh, and then we're starting to scale that down into multiple models. And we have four models in total that we're, we're making in this product line. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was um, at low frequency, there's different ways to make a box. You can have a sealed box, or you can have a reflex box. A reflex box can be a port, or it can be a passive radiator. Um, the sealed boxes have great transient response, but have the lowest output and have the lowest sensitivity. So you actually, for a given low frequency extension, they're 3 dB less sensitivity, so it takes twice the power to drive them as what a, a reflex box is. But a reflex box, a port, can have other problems. It can have its own non-linearities where as you start to drive it harder, it starts to make chuffing noises, compress, have pipe resonances, have mid-range leakage through it, have all kinds of problems with it. So we did passive radiators, which have the same benefit of a port uh, where they extend bass, they reduce distortion where they're tuned, but they um, don't have those other you know, distortion generating issues. They're more expensive, but that's what we developed here. So here's a, here's a, uh, uh, a passive. They are tuned? They are tuned just like a port. And they actually, how you get to the tuning is by mass. So the air mass in a port uh, by its length is how it's tuned. And in this case, if you took a, a port of the equivalent surface area, the passive needs to weigh what that air mass would weigh in, in the vent. So um, they're quite large because um, you want to have them, um, they need about two to three times the displacement of the woofers. So we have four 10 inch passives on our largest speaker. Uh, on our smaller tower that's behind me, that's a new model. This has passives that are um, an oval shape so we can place them on the back. And um, they're, they're uh, a, a six by nine. You can see they're very soft. And the reason for that is, um, Passives do have their own compliance and will cancel ultra, ultra deep bass if they're not made soft enough. So we engineer these very specifically to not have that issue. Um, and so that's what's tuning the enclosure. Six by nine is I had those in the back. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, in the case of a passive, they're only playing a deep bass note, so there's not any sort of like directionality to them, so the shape doesn't matter so much. Um, wh whereas with a cone mid-range or things, that would influence it a lot. Um, but they're just a, a moving resonator, basically. So the, the last component um, of our designs is how are we going to make a great sounding speaker box? So we ended up um, using hot pressed MDF and lots of bracing in there, but we also have a unique composite material that we're using um, throughout these speakers. And it's a thermoset resin that the front panels are made out of. And this is about the same density as aluminum, but we can form it into complex shapes and it doesn't, uh, it has better damping than aluminum, so it doesn't ring as much. Um, and it's not quite as stiff, but the damping really helps acoustically. And you can feel how heavy it is. Um, it's not like a normal, you know, polymer plastic kind of feeling material. So what we're doing um, on here is, um, we have some new techniques we're using. This is a new model that we're gonna be launching this fall or winter. Um, 
and what we're doing in this one, it's a little different, is we're actually mounting the drive units directly to this panel. In our other models, there's basically double front panels to the speaker. Um, but that's a big part of the, the rigidity and the sound of the speaker. Is that CAS? It's, it's like a, it's a dough ball molding process, so they actually, it's compression molded. Uh, and it's a thermoset material, so there's heater cores in a steel mold that heat it up. And it's, it's similar to like, you know, almost like a casting process, but instead of cooling it, you're, you're heating it, you know. Um, and uh, it's a material called BMC uh, that's been specifically formulated for a version of that for acoustics. Um, and we really like that material and it's, um, so th those are some of the kind of building blocks that we've, we've used for the speakers. Yeah, please. When you mount directly to that, how do you attach it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have, um, I, I kind of got ready for that question. So there's, there's a very long um, <laughs> machine screw here. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we're doing is um, we're grabbing um, the whole front face of the speaker and tensioning it. Uh, and so there, there's machine screws with these brass inserts into the front, but then we're, when you put an enclosure under tension, it makes it nice and rigid, and we have a, a damping ma material in between the front face of the speaker and the box. So there's a lot of thinking going into the, the speaker enclosure, because the enclosure, you want to minimize its contribution to the sound. Um, and so this is a very rigid way to make it. We have kind of these plastic bushings, you know, routed into some wood, so it's a very solid way to grab it and easy to access. So. In this case, we were able to rear mount the drive units and also make them look nice and clean so you don't see any fasteners because it's all just uh, through those, those large shoulder screws. So you said for this model, yes. you're connecting the drivers directly to the base plate mm -hmm. and not in the... Well, we, well we, we do on the 30 for the mid and tweeter, um, but we don't for the... I'm sorry, for the tweeter, but we don't for the woofers um, just because, um, you know, we, uh, you know, had basically had a wood box with a separate fascia mm -hmm. on that, um, whereas the tweeter is mounted directly. This, we, we've taken another approach. Part of it was how do you scale down? We have this flagship model that has, uh, we've been fortunate enough to get the cover of a few magazines, including Absolute Sound and Hi-Fi News, and got a lot of great press on it, but how do you take those technologies and scale them down into smaller models? So, um, and what, what do you sacrifice in that? And the th one of the things we came up with was a way to make this product a little less expensive was to remove some wood out of the enclosure, but, but try to Im improve the performance in some ways by directly mounting and doing all this other stuff. So it was a way to just do it differently in this to try to strike a balance between cost and performance. So this is about a third the price of our largest model, but we try to bring as much of the same technology in that as we can. So it's been a, you know, a four year project so far to bring, start trickling this down. We've got one more model I'm working on, but, um, you know, we, uh, we did a lot of work, you know, Paul's, uh, uh, we, we do a lot of listening work here. So in addition to the core technologies of kind of these low distortion bits and pieces and, and all of that, we, um, um, this is actually a, a measurement rig that I have to set on, which is uh, kind of, we do a lot of listening and measurement. So this is a turntable that we can lift in the air and um, measure the sound in, in 360 degrees around the speaker in multiple orientations so we can characterize what the, the, the entire sound going into a room is, because uh, there's been a lot of studies uh, about what people prefer with sound uh, from speakers, and it's generally um, very broad, even coverage and very smooth response, both on and off axis, so directly coming from the speaker into the side. So we do that, but we also do a lot of listening, so we'll bring it up in our listening rooms and make sure that what we measure here is also what we hear and go back and forth. Um, so that's kind of our, our design process. And, um, you know, we are, um, at this point, um, you know, just getting these sort of out into the wild. Uh, so, you know, some of you guys have heard them at shows and stuff, but it had been, you know, about a year in the market. Uh, and, um, you know, so far it's been, been really fun to see people's um, uh, response. It was a bit of a, uh, you know, a different approach with the speakers because there aren't, there are a lot of people selling speakers online, but there's not a lot of peop people selling speakers of this level online direct to the consumer. So part of it was a question of, will this be a success uh, from a business perspective? Because there, there's a direct relationship with customers, which we really like, but then there's also a setup component 
to the speakers where um, you, are, uh, you are the dealer in, in a sense as far as setting things up with our, our consultants. So Paul's written a couple of uh, books regarding speaker setup. Um, and then we also um, tried to make a speaker that was very livable as far as you know, different positions in the room and have some flexibility as far as tuning. So we've really tried to um, you know, fill that gap and make sure people are happy. And so far it's been really tremendous. I, you know, we haven't really seen any products you know, come back and people have really been enjoying them. But that's you know, one of the challenges we faced with this project. Uh, and so part of, um, you know, for me, to, wanted to give you a, a, a little you know, show and tell of what's next. So, the, so these guys are in our, our um, pre-production, um, but then we're also working on a smaller bookshelf. And then I have a couple of big woofers around here, so we're considering um, <laughs> the, sub, the subwoofer, <laughs> subwoofer world. Um, yeah, so that's not a um, that's a that's an early early peak. Yeah, this is uh, so so one of the cool things about developing. Um, high performance woofers is we came up with this motor, you know, so we're using this motor structure. If you notice, this is a six and a half inch woofer from an upcoming bookshelf. And you see this kind of angled metal structure and all of this, how it looks the same as, as that. So what we did is we, if you take this, these low distortion technologies we, we've been working on um, as far as these double suspensions and advanced motors and stuff and scale that up, uh, the, the problems that you encounter in woofers are mag magnified in subwoofers. Even though we're not as sensitive hearing-wise at low frequency, you're putting more power and more excursion and more things that cause distortion happen at those frequencies. So, you know, it becomes even more important there. So, par part of, um, you know, the, the uh, people's preferences as far as great sound quality comes down to extended deep bass and, and sort of effortless output down there. And so um, that's something that's been a hallmark of our speakers, but also, um, you know, I'd love to take a crack at the subwoofer market with that. We'll see. I mean, there's, you know, we're a small company and there's a lot of prior development priorities and I'd like to make some less expensive products too. You know, we started out with some big flagship stuff that isn't necessarily the core of our, uh, you know, customers and, and market, but it, it was something that we wanted to establish credibility and show what we're capable of and then, uh, you know, build the technologies first and trickle them down. Um, but the subs, subs are pretty fun. So this is a, about an 80 pound uh, subwoofer. And um, we've got a 12 inch version over there too, but it's, um, this is an 18 and it's capable of 35 millimeters each way of travel before it hits its distortion limit. Um, so it has a four inch diameter voice coil, 10 inch diameter spider. These are 10 inch diameter magnets. So, um, and it has, um, we, we, we employ these uh, distortion reducing copper rings in the, in the motors also to keep, um, keep distortion low through the low mid range and sort of uh, allow it to play upper bass, you know, punchy and clean without having these inductance problems. So that has multiple copper rings in it and stuff. So the orange was, is not uh, probably gonna make it into the final products, but this is, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is something fun. Um, Chris, can you talk about that split ring? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is a, a magnet structure that has a split gap. So what? There's a few different ways you can make a woofer. A woofer is like a linear electric motor, and um, how it works is you know you have a coil of wire, their amplifier is powering, and it's an electromagnet, and then you have a magnetic gap here that the electromagnet is working against. So there's a flux in the motor and then the coil moves in and out based off of the audio signal that your amp is putting to it. The problem is that whole system, even though it was invented in the 1920s and things haven't progressed that far from that idea of a moving coil, um, that's a pretty non-linear system because you have a, the, the magnet system itself is not very linear. It has flux that as soon as the coil starts moving, you, you lose force in either direction. So you have like a compression built in. So as the more power you put in, it doesn't reproduce the same waveform you're putting in. It, it compresses it, especially at low frequency. And then you also have, um, so, so what this is, is it's two magnetic gaps where the coil, as you lose turns for one gap, you gain turns into the other gap. So it's a commutating coil. So you can imagine um, the force stays a lot more constant versus uh, its excursion because you're, 
uh, the magnetic field as you're losing some from one you're gaining some into the other so it's a kind of a unique approach my um, I actually worked in my 20s for a company that innovated that and it's now sort of in the in the public domain Single voice coil with multiple magnetic air gaps. Yeah. It would be considered underhung. Well, so so the term underhung means that the 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 physical plate here is taller than the coil, and that's a very linear way to go, as well. But the problem with underhung. I thought that was a male thing. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. So, yep. Ooh, it's getting spicy. Uh, so so. I don't have a lot of visual aids to show what's going on the inside here, but what, what you have is normally 99% of woofers on the market, the coil's longer than the gap. And the, the benefit of that is you're using all of the flux in the system, uh, pretty much, because the coil overlaps the, the gap, and so all of that flux is being utilized by the coil. In an underhung, uh, it's a much taller gap, and the coil's very small, and it's very linear, but the problem is you're only using maybe a third of the flux in the system or less. And so you end up having low sensitivity, low output, the coil is shorter, um, and so you have lower power handling, and you also have more, um, the, the issue you run into is that the steel is not linear, it actually has this memory called hysteresis, where uh, you want the steel up into the flatter part of its hysteresis curve, so it's called saturated. Otherwise, what happens is as the coil is pushing and pulling against the woofer, the, the woofer motor, it actually raises and lowers the flux the, or the force factor of the system. It's called force factor modulation. So imagine like as it's moving into the motor, you're gaining force and as it's moving out, you're losing it. And so it ends up causing the whole sensitivity, the whole speaker to amplitude modulate, have these complex distortions. And that's pretty bad. And underhungs are a lot worse at that because the top plate's so large, you can't saturate it. So this is sort of somewhere in between the two. Uh, there are people that do underhung woofers that are very good, like Magico does underhungs and Teal and a few others. But you need, you put these giant magnets on them and they still have some of these issues. So this is kind of, it's not unique to us, but we're only one of a couple folks in the market doing this type of motor structure. And it's something that I haven't seen, you know, made it with planers and we've got kind of a unique approach to the, t the tech. Um, and it works really well in high excursion subwoofers, which isn't, Underhung woofers don't, you don't see any real high excursion subs with underhung because that you're lacking in motor force so much it doesn't, you need a lot of force to drive a large mm -hmm. uh, driver. So, um, but that's a great question. Um, but yeah, so this is something that I hope we can, uh, you know, in subs, there hasn't been a lot of innovation beyond some of the DSP stuff. There hasn't been a lot of driver innovation for, you know, 20 plus years. So, about your magnet. Mm -hmm. is it just too expensive to go with Neo magnet? Or? Well, so Neo is is about 20 times the strength of ceramic magnets. Right. But the problem you run into with high excursion subwoofers is um, you need clearance for the coil to move. So if you want to have, you know, the, the magnet is so small on Neo, it, it's not a spacer for the coil to move. So you have to make a big steel cup around it. And then the steel itself, you know, compounds the issue where you need these these giant sort of cans of steel and it doesn't really buy you anything at that point because um, you sort of, even though it's smaller, it doesn't really benefit you. You need the space anyway for clearance. Um, and so uh, I like Neo. We use it extensively in the uh, mid-range and tweeters. So these are N52 Neo magnets, super strong magnets. They make a huge difference in the planers because the magnets sit in front of the diaphragm and uh, act as an acoustic filter. So the thicker you make those, the worse the performance. And in our case, we can make them ultra thin because they're ultra strong Neo. But in a, in a subwoofer and in a woofer, Neo has some negatives where it's temperature sensitive, uh, where you can demagnetize it with heat. Um, so you have to design around that, which is, it can be done. There are high power woofers with it. It's just, it's a design constraint. And also we're finding large, um, so Neo is, 93% of the world's supply of NEO is in China, and um, the market is pretty volatile because it's being used in, in windmills and electric motors for cars and other applications. And it's gone up in price, up and down as much as 2,000% over the last 15 years. And it doubled for a while there a couple of years ago and then went back down. So as a manufacturer, it is pretty unstable, whereas ceramic um, you know, magnets are very you know, the cost hasn't moved around. And it, it's something where 
you know, flux is flux. The, the coil doesn't know whether it's getting it from a, a neomagnet or from a ceramic magnet. There's really not a, a big difference performance-wise. Um, but that's a, that's a great question. I like, I like using it where I can. Um, there, there's some unique things you can do with combinations of neo and ceramic that I'm looking into as well, where, um, you know, neo is uh, pre-charged neo. Um, unlike steel, doesn't modulate because it's already completely saturated. So you can use it in places to improve performance, uh, you know, even in a ceramic motor so it's neo neodymium neodymium iron boron magnets and and that is the the highest strength of magnets used in speakers um, historically speakers used almaco uh, which was aluminum nickel cobalt ma magnets but in the 1970s there was a shortage of, of cobalt because of some uh, conflict in africa and so they switched over to ceramic in 1973 pretty much um, and so that's what you've seen historically. Almost everything is made with ceramic magnets. Neo, the first uh, patents expired in the early 90s from Japanese and German sources, and KEF innovated it in tweeters. Um, I mean, but the original KEF Uniq, that, that was the idea, was you could make the magnet small enough you could stick it on the top of a pole of a woofer, but that magnet at the time was about $250. Uh, so just, and so the market has really changed with Neo, but now you're finding some people moving away from Neo at times because unless you need it for a lightweight, like for professional audio or for compact devices, it doesn't necessarily buy you anything. And in some cases it's, you know, you're just adding cost unnecessarily. And so in our case, you know, with the woofers, I could have shaved a few pounds off the woofers, but it, would have been at a pretty substantial price premium and we wanted to try to be you know, even in a high-end product we're always looking for opportunities to you know um, give the most value and I think that's you know Can you, could you go through the FR20 and the, the yeah yeah the FR20 and the FR30 yeah yeah so these are um, you know this was our first model and when we built it um, you know this is a Really high performance speaker, but really just physically too large for a lot of rooms and for people's budgets. So the idea was, you know, how do we scale this down? Um, and in our case, we took the same, you know, mid tweeter module here and um, incorporated a new uh, woofer with it. So it's the same magnet structure, but we're using a much lighter cone and different uh, coil so that it's these two woofers are about the same sensitivity as these four. These each work in smaller boxes, so they're not equivalent. You know, you, you, you couldn't just put these into this speaker and make it higher performance. They're specifically tuned for each box, but we have um, a speaker that is, you know, about 33%, you know, less with this, but offers the same bass extension um, and very similar sonics. They're not, I, they're not identical. I, mean, I think the, the FR30 still has lower distortion because you have twice the woofers and it has a rear tweeter and some additional uh, features to it, but this gives you, you know, much of the same performance as our flagship model um, in, in a smaller package. Still, you know, large for a lot of people, but it has, you know, 20, 25 hertz extension and very high output. The, the main kind of performance difference between these two is when you double the number of woofers, you gain twice the, the output. So you have 6 dB of difference in output between these two, which, and so it really depends on how close you're seated to the speakers and the size of your room and your music listening preferences on how much, how much output do you really need. But they're very similar, you know, kinds of speakers. And the, we, we did the same kind of thing moving down to this model, which is uh, FR10, but we, we moved from eight inch woofers down to six and a half. And those are uh, half the cone area of an eight, basically. Um, you know, as you go, between a uh, eight and six and a half, um, you know, you're losing about 6 dB of out output here. One of the ways we in increase the output is these don't play quite as deep. These goes, go down to about 30 hertz instead of the 20-ish hertz of these guys. Um, and then we're using a smaller mid-range panel. So this is the, the mid-range panel we're using on that. So that's how we've sort of scaled down the models is giving you the same quality level, but just reducing the, the base extension slightly in the output a little bit. Um, yes. What, what room sizes would those be good up to? Let's say. Uh, well, it, you know, it's actually room volume doesn't really tell you anything. It's something that people often use when they're asking questions. Um, the big difference. So, what rooms are doing at low frequency is below the 
half wavelength of the longest dimension in your room, you start getting a boost in deep bass. So in a small room, you get a lot more deep bass. So in larger rooms, you need more speaker just for that reason or subwoofers. Um, but there's no reason why you couldn't put a large speaker in a small room. Um, there's, there's sort of, I think, misinformation in the market about that, that you need a small speaker for a small room. It's mainly a visual thing. Um, you know, there are room modes, even if you put a small speaker in a small room, you have just the same room modes as you would with the larger speaker there. The, the main issue comes down to a speaker at low frequency radiates sound in a 360, in a sphere all, all the way around it. And so as you place it near room boundaries, like you place it near a wall or uh, you know, near the front wall or side wall, it constrains the radiation and boosts the bass. So the low mid-range and bass get lifted up. So it really comes down to what was the assumption that the designer made about where that speaker is gonna sit in the room. Uh, because some speakers are designed uh, to be able to be placed nearer to a wall because they don't have as full a low frequency and, and bass voicing, and others are voiced fuller where they need to be out in the room to sound correct. And that's actually a bigger impact than the size of the speaker. Um, so we've had people use very large speakers of ours in very small rooms with good results uh, because we voice them flat in the bass. They're not particularly rich in the bass. Like they can be placed pretty near a boundary. You also have a boundary control switch here where you can voice up the mid-range and treble to match the bass boost you get when placing it near uh, a side wall or front wall. There are other reasons why you don't really want to place a speaker near a wall, and that comes down to imaging and spaciousness and things, because the further you come out from a wall, the later the reflections are versus the direct sound, and you get better localization and spaciousness and other things. Um, but all of these will work in similar rooms, strange, strange. It's a weird thing to say. The other thing you have to look at is, uh, the one thing I wouldn't recommend them for is a near field setup, because um, in order for the mid tweeter and woofer to integrate, you need to be about seven times the distance of their center to center spacing. So like this distance here, um, for them to fully integrate. So that uh, there, are drive, there are speakers that have tighter packed drive units and smaller drive units that integrate at a closer distance. So this requires you to be seven or eight feet away from it uh, to fully integrate. Um, there are little two way monitors where you can sit couple of feet away and you'll, you'll be in. So that's, if you're doing like near field computer listening or other stuff, I would recommend a, not recommend a big three-way tower speaker. You were saying rule of thumb seven times the distance between the, the mid and the tweeter? Yeah, the center to center distance. Well, it, it, it's actually, um, you know, that's just the, the, the mathematical distance of near field versus far field. What happens when you get closer to that is, is that um, the individual directional characteristics of the woofer start to come into play. It's not that you can't listen closer than that, it's just that's the near field, far field transition, you know, boundary basically, yeah. The tweeter height seems different on all these speakers. Um, is that important for listening beyond your ear axis? Or? Uh, well, so yes, um, there, this, the typical seated ear height of an adult male is about 36 to 39 inches. Uh, the, Tom Norton at Sterofile did a study of that and published an article about it. Um, but basically, um, so it, depending on your design, you can choose an arbitrary place as the design axis of a speaker and you can make the crossover combine correctly at that axis. So some manufacturers choose the center of their mid, some choose the lip between the mid and the tweeter, some choose the tweeter. Um, as where the speaker is the flattest on axis. That being said, only part of what you hear is the right on axis sound and there's all this stuff bouncing around the room that's most of your, so it's really the overall presentation, you know, uh, is, is, can be affected by that but isn't solely that. But I would say yes, um, we made, uh, because we wanted a really powerful woofer section, FR30 tweeter's a little higher than what your ear height would be typically and, um, one of the things in tuning the speakers we find is that some people like that sense of height, but that uh, also if you want the most sort of airiness, you can aim the speaker, tilt the speakers down slightly toward your, your ear height. Using the uh, attached spikes, you can adjust them up and down, you can rake them. So um, accomplishes the same thing then as lowering the tweeter it, it does, yeah. But these other speakers have the tweeter height right at ear height. So this is at 
37 and that's at 37. So the, the, the FR30 is the only one that deviates and part of it is that we wanted to have this big powerful woofer section and we have this kind of floating base and that you know pushed us up a little higher but the performance is still very good even slightly below the tweeter axis. Um, but that's a great, yeah, great question. Have yeah. you considered uh, an option to have active crossovers instead of passive because passive sucks the life out of things sometimes? You know? Well, yeah, so there, active versus passive is an interesting debate. Um, I will say um, active speakers, there are benefits to active speakers. Um, it's not that they're not without their compromises because you've just shifted the compromise to what's the quality of your DACs and amps and now needing three or four times the number of those in a system. Um, whereas um, in a passive system, um, you know, we, we're, these are examples of our crossovers here, so we're using you know, real high high performance uh, crossover parts. So like this is a six pound air core inductor that's very, you know, very linear, hand, handles tons of power, very low resistance. So we're on, you're only reducing the woofer output by a fraction of a dB, you know, with the amount of resistance in this coil. It's only a, you know, a couple tenths of an ohm. Um, but at the same time, um, with an active system, uh, the crossovers aren't just a crossover. They're not just a slope. There's a lot of shaping involved. So you would need to give someone uh, access to directly to the drive units and then all the sort of filter coefficients and stuff and have outboard amps and you could do that or you could build an active speaker um, and you know we've looked at active speakers it's something that is a point of interest moving forward because they're I mean one of the cool things uh, about active speakers is you can put um, you know, streaming functionality, you can have kind of all-in-one stuff, wireless, app control, you can have different sound profiles, you know, the different presets and things in there. So there's a lot of benefits in ease of use and system simplicity where you're just kind of putting all the complication inside the box. Um, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. Audiophile customers historically haven't liked active speakers. You had um, you know, a few people trying to pioneer it like uh, Meridian and then nowadays you have a lot more. Um, but um, part of the reason active speakers never really took off in the home theater world is that um, AV receivers were about the same price as a preamp processor. So you're getting seven channels of amplifier for free, essentially. And so active speakers, you have three times the number of amps. So suddenly the difference in price is, you know, many times more for an active speaker. Um, and so, um, but nowadays I think that's changing. You have sort of inexpensive Cool, cooler running class D amps that are great for driving woofers and lots more you know, sophistication in what you can do in signal processing where active speakers can give you more bass and more output in some ways because you can use dynamic limiting and other stuff. So I'd love to do it down the road. The problem is it's sort of an orphan product because you know, we're a company that, you know, the audio, a lot of the audio file world is you're disaggregating a system. You you're, you're have separate DAC, separate amp, separate preamp, separate phono stage to get the most performance per Per piece, and if I made an active speaker that had all that in one, then it doesn't really pair with anything that we do, and also a lot of people's existing systems. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, it's uh, like I like uh, John Darko he calls it futurefy. So it's like this all-in-one, highly integrated thing, and guys are doing some pretty cool things with it. I really like some of the stuff that like key speakers and Dutch and Dutch, and some of these guys are doing with an all-in-one. It's kind of like the ideal like New York apartment speaker, or like. Scandinavian, like I'm, I'm just on an all-in-one does everything box that sounds great. And I think that's a goal. Uh, you know, one of the, my, uh, the big uh, appeals of coming to PS is we have all the building blocks for this. We make amplifiers, we make DACs, we make, now we're making speakers, we're building technologies towards that. But it's something that, I think it's for a new customer. It's maybe not for an existing PS customer. Maybe it's for a second home of theirs or for a bedroom or for the, you know, kitchen or, you know, vacation home. It's not part of your big, you know, discrete component hi-fi system, but you can do a lot of really slick things with it. So we're in talks with people about these things. Um, and I think a lot of the technologies we have, you know, in developing active subs or other things carry over into active speakers. But to make a, an active speaker that's user accessible where you can say, oh, you can amplify this or not amplify it. I know Lynn is doing that. Uh, and it's a great way to sell a lot more amplifiers, but it's just, um, you know, adds a lot of system complexity because you have to bypass all the networks and have a bunch of terminals there. And it's hard to do that in a very slick way unless it's all built in. 
Um, one more question. Yeah. Anybody got another question? Well, we do have a luminary other than Chris here. <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, we got EJ. Yeah. If you, yeah. Want, if you want to introduce him to our YouTube crowd. Oh, yeah. You should. Him, oh, okay. Yeah. You should. Um, yeah. EJ uh, is. Y- why don't you come over here? Um, he's a uh, local, um, yeah, luminary with loudspeakers. So, um, among other things, EJ's developed uh, some really high performance uh, AMT with uh, unique you know, arced versions for uh, concert or activity or wide coverage and licensed it to a bunch of different companies. And, and you, I don't know, what, and headphones, would you, what, what would you call yourself? Like a inventor uh, or inventor, scientists? Uh, uh, and glutton for punishment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there are some similarities in planers versus AMTs. AMTs um, that EJ's become an expert in, um, are a little different because it's a pleated diaphragm that's like a bellows where you're, you're sort of moving the diaphragm uh, in this axis and squeezing air through the, the pleats where this is, uh, you know, a m- different magnet configuration and you're just moving it axially and it's a, like a bilaterally tensioned, you know, drum skin kind of diaphragm. So it's a, they're kind of cousins, but pretty different. But EJ's made some really amazing stuff. So, uh, and we're lucky to have them here in, uh, in, in the Boulder area and as part of the Audio Society here. And you, you went to Munich this year, didn't you? Uh, my speakers did. I did. Your rise. speakers did? Yeah. yeah. And so you're doing stuff with uh, the Western Electric guys and yeah, some of the. Yeah, they're my main licensee right now. And they, yeah. They showed at Munich and people really love the speakers. Yeah. Quite a bit. Yeah, very serious deal. So if you haven't seen that already, you should check out. Uh, the Aria Airblade and the Western Electric stuff, and yeah, they call it the Triple Seven driver. Okay, Triple Seven, Triple which is yeah, 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 this really cool. Um, it's kind of got a '57 Chevy Bel Air kind of look to the whole it's thing. Funky, it's, yeah. it's got some wings. <laughs> um, very cool. So yeah, check that one out if you haven't seen it. So yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a curved air motion transformer AMT. Uh, traditional AMTs that Oscar Heil invented back in the '70s are, are flat, basically. Uh, they look a lot like the, the, uh, yeah. the tweeter and mid-range that are in these uh, traditional ones, uh, but but mine, I figured out a way to curve it. I patented that, that type of curvature. Uh, so it's uh, just hitting the market, uh, should be any day now, uh, from Western Electric. So cool, yeah. Go to westernelectric.com and check out the 777 mid-range. <laughs> okay. Nice, right. nice. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Okay, thank you.